Good morning. Good morning. We're going to begin the program now. There'll be visiting time over the next couple of days. Please make full use of it. As we turn this over to the scheduled programming, I just wanted to make two, well, at least one, one point. We've brought the blanket back, the quilt, the star quilt that uh, we bring and is entrusted with Duncan Campbell and Edna Brillen here in Boulder. It was made up in rosebud, and we use it every year. And we, we, we drape it on the empty chair. The empty chair is that tradition that recognizes all those who've gone before us and who've gone on and can't be here. Those who are with us now today but can't be here. And all of those generations yet to come, we call upon all of them to be witness to these three days of gatherings so that we are all here together. Oh, mitakwi o yasin. Good morning. Before we officially get started, I do want to announce that we've got two different media crews here who will be taking photographs and uh, doing uh, interviews. So we have um, from Cultural Survival uh, two of our staff members, uh, Jamie Malcolm Brown and um, Sheldon Ferris. And um, our policy is to, to respectfully seek your permission for any interviews, for any photographs, um, videos we might do, and uh, they will handle that. But if you have any objection to this, both in the group photos or individual photos, please let us know. Our work is used um, in our cultural survival quarterly. I don't know if someone has one. Uh, Miriam, can you hold one up? We publish this four times a year, so that's where the information goes. We also develop uh, radio programs um, to disseminate internationally on these conversations, so that's where the interviews will also go. So I just wanted to make that announcement. Thank you. From Olohana, we are also documenting. We've been documenting for, from the first year of Rising Voices. So Alex, Sarah, myself, you might see us with cameras. Um, if anybody has any objection, please come see us, and we'll make sure we don't film you. Thanks. All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> Gosh, this is wonderful. We are humbled and honored and so excited to have everybody in the room here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we have a few remarks about welcoming you here to Rising Voices, the fifth year of this meeting, um, and a couple of uh, sort of pragmatic notes to keep in the back of your mind. And then um, on the agenda, we did have participant introductions. We do want to do that still. I think what we will do is, um, in a couple of minutes, invite you to have a few minutes to talk, uh, to introduce yourself to your table mates, and um, then throughout the course of the next two and a half days, really get to know everybody else as well. Um, that seems that that's going to be the best way we can fit, keep with our time on the agenda here. So um, let's see. Is there something you want to say? Yeah, thank you all. Um, I also, before we fully get started, um, I mean, we recognize that introducing ourselves is exceptionally important, um, you know, and just given the size of the group, and so emphasizing what Heather said, we really encourage you, especially during the breakouts, during lunch, you know, try to find someone you don't know, someone maybe you haven't seen in 20 years, um, and reconnect with them, you know, and just introduce yourself and, you know, reach out about maybe why you're here, um, what was it that inspired inspired your presence today. Um, I also want to acknowledge, you'll probably laugh if you saw the room we were going to squeeze you all into, 
Um, and this woman next to me went through 20,000 leagues under the sea, basically, to uh, score in the 11th hour this space for us. So the fact that we can like all have oxygen <laughs> and stretch a little. So I just we just need a quick second, because this is phenomenal. Um, and we just want to run you through a little bit how the next couple days are going to go. Um, we're <coughs> stepping back a little bit this year while we also look forward. And so we recognize this is our fifth gathering, and so it's also a time of reflection, right? We have a lot of new people with us, new faces, new ideas, new perspectives. Um, and we also have a lot of continuity with people who have returned year after year who have really built this to what it is. Um, and so we want to, at, on one hand, reflect on where we've been, and on the other hand, reflect on where we're going, right? And really starting this path, especially now, towards what are the action steps we need when we leave here on Saturday, right? And so really always thinking back while we're also thinking ahead during this time together. And we're going to run this. Um, we're really, you know, as doing this, you know, um, the gracious host of NCAR, um, you know, this is really a collaborative effort, right? It is not just an indigenous organization. It's not just a climate science organization, right? It's about bringing these different elements, these different perspectives, these different sciences together in a conversation. Um, and what we really would like to do here is to have this dialogue where we discuss how do such collaborations work, how have they not worked maybe so well? What can we learn from that? And what can we now do in the state we find ourselves to move forward together in a respectful and appropriate manner? And so we're going to do this in a couple of ways. One is we are going to have kind of more that you know, conference idea of having some presentations. We're going to hear from people about how they've been working in collaborations, what's worked, what hasn't, what can we learn from their efforts. We're also going to hear from people about how we can build these things, right? Often the question I think we all find ourselves with is where do I start, right? How do I get started? What's the first step? What's before the first step even, right? And so we're going to have that conversation as well. Um, and we're expanding a bit this year, kind of our minds and horizon with cultural survival and really also bringing in the international focus, right? So this is not just about what's happening in the US. This is also very much what is, what is happening at the international level and how can we think from both the local to international scale and how these flow back and forth together. And the biggest part of this, too, is really um, the breakout group sessions. We'll explain it a bit more as we get to it, but just to give you a heads up, um, later today and then uh, for a good part of tomorrow, we're going to be in breakout groups. There are five themes, water, health and livelihoods, phenology, relocation, and energy. And these are all listed in your agenda. Um, there will be a couple breakout groups for each topic, just because we don't want too many people in any one group. Obviously, if there's only a few of your, in your group, you know, you can merge with another, but we really encourage to not make the groups too big so everyone's voice can be heard and included. Um, and in that process is where we really want to hear your engagement. So, right, th so this isn't a gathering where we ask you to come and just sit and listen. We ask you to participate. Right, so you're actively listening, but you're also actively engaging in speaking and saying what it is where you're coming from and what you bring to this dialogue. Um, and those notes will go into the Saturday session where we'll, um, Cultural Survival will be leading us in pulling together a suite of recommendations um, to um, move forward to the UN Permanent Forum with the international um, contingent that's that's here with us today. What else did I forget? I remembered it all. <laughs> okay. we'll, we'll oh, intro. intro is it too? But I was going to do that at the end, just so people can go and drink. So, um, thanks. Great. So a couple of pragmatic things. Um, for those of you who are here a couple years ago for Rising Voices 3, you may remember that there was another filming effort um, which fed into an exhibit called Climate Voices. Um, I'm not forgetting the exact name of the 
It's along those lines, up at the Mesa Lab, and it's terrific. If you do have a chance while you're here in Boulder to explore up at the Mesa Lab at NCAR, that's the one, the iconic building up in the Flatirons. It's beautiful. We can point you in that direction. Um, but we're lucky to have a small display of some of the videos, some of the interviews that were turned into video for that exhibit, and they are um, directly outside of this door on a screen on a, a tall table. So I encourage you to stop by that during the poster session. Posters are up and will be um, up. Presenters are encouraged to hang out by their poster during the breaks and lunch so that that's another opportunity to sort of share some of the work that you've been working on um, with the uh, rest of the folks here. And I wanted to mention this ahead of plans for lunch. I know it's early for that yet, but um, we regret that because this is a primarily federally funded event, we cannot offer uh, to pay for your lunch. There's a cafeteria just at this end of the lobby. It's cash only. Um, if that is a problem, there's an ATM over here, or please come see me, and um, we'll make sure that you get lunch. There are bathrooms in this far corner of the lobby if you haven't discovered those already, so feel free. We do have several breaks on the agenda, but if you need to jump up, stretch your legs, go for it. Um, Without further ado, we have a few folks we really wanted to hear from this morning to start us off. And to begin that, I would love to welcome Jim Hurl, who is the director of NCAR. And gosh, I think before you even stepped into that position, he came to Rising Voices One and gave a welcome there as well. So some of these faces will be familiar to you and likewise, and um, some will be new. So a welcome to James, please. Thank you very much, and good morning to all of you. It's truly a great pleasure and an honor to uh, welcome you back to Boulder. Um, I know it was very important and good reason to go to Hawaii, uh, but Heather and her team keep me busy enough back here in Boulder I couldn't go last year. So from a selfish perspective, I'm, I'm very glad that you're back. Um, as Heather said, my name is Jim Hurl, and uh, for the last four years I've had the pleasure and the honor of serving as the director of the National Center for Atmospheric Research here in Boulder. But before I took on that role, uh, I was fortunate enough to become engaged in this collaborative activity. And it's incredibly unique, it's incredibly special, it's incredibly important. So at a very personal level, I'm honored to be here and to participate again this year. I'd like to thank um, Heather and Julie and Bob and all the others that put so much effort into putting this together. I'd like to thank uh, Chris and the administrative team who work on all the logistics for this. And most importantly, I'd like to thank all of you because I know many of you have come a long ways and you're taking uh, time away from very important and busy lives to be here. And so thank you very much for coming. And it's amazing to see how this event has grown which I think really reflects the significance and the importance of uh, why we're all here. I'm not going to take very much time to talk about NCAR per se, but for those of you that are not familiar with this organization, just very briefly, uh, the National Center here is the National Science Foundation's largest and oldest FFRDC, Federally Funded Research and Development Center. We were established in 1960 with the primary purpose of enhancing the effectiveness of atmospheric and related research uh, for the nation and indeed internationally. And we do this because we're really grounded in the fundamental principle of collaboration. And I'll say a bit more about that in just a second. So we are here to deal with very challenging problems um, such as understanding the processes and the mechanisms and then modeling those and trying to improve our predictive capability for things like uh, severe weather, weather hazards, and of course the myriad of challenges that come with climate variability and climate change. And uh, the, the, the real benefit that NCAR brings to these kinds of challenges is indeed our collaborative nature. So I have all kinds of statistics that talk about how the research community comes together and we make fundamental progress on improving our modeling systems and our observational systems and things like that. But NCAR, I firmly believe, needs to play a broader role than just that, as important as that is. And that's uh, 
to really be committed to efforts to bring communities together, not only communities of physical scientists bringing oceanographers and terrestrial scientists and hydrologists and atmospheric scientists together to understand this complex environment um, that is ours, but also commitment to bringing together social scientists with these physical scientists and local community members to really assess critical community needs in the face of these environmental challenges, to brainstorm, to collaborate, to come up with joint solutions, and to pursue joint research aimed at developing optimal plans for community action towards sustainability in the face of these environmental challenges. And Rising Voices, in my opinion, is a, a perfect example of this, and it's a terrific example of this. Um, as we know, and why we're here today, indigenous communities are perhaps particularly affected by the risks and the impacts of uh, hazardous weather and climate variability and climate change, perhaps even threatening indigenous cultures and the very way of life. Thus, partnerships between experts uh, with backgrounds in both indigenous and Western culture are the key way forward. And that's why this is such a terrific collection of dedicated and passionate individuals. So on behalf of all of us at NCAR, it's truly a pleasure and an honor to welcome all of you to Boulder once again. Um, I wish you a very, very productive workshop. I'm very pleased to participate in it in any way that I can. I'm a strong supporter of it. And thank you all again for coming, and I wish you a very satisfying and productive next three days. So thank you. Thank you, Jim. And really, I mean, I can't say enough how deep my gratitude and appreciation is for uh, Jim's support. None of us would be in this room right now without the support that we've received over the past five years. Both, you know, and I think that that really is testimony to a vision for the National Center for Atmospheric Research that sees research happening in tandem, in conjunction, and in close collaboration with people on the ground, people in other institutions who have different perspectives. And I, I feel so strongly that um, you get more perspectives, the more folks you have around the table with more different backgrounds, and that we are at a time when those perspectives will help us find more and better solutions. And we cannot possibly afford not to have as many solutions and the best solutions to the world, to the challenges that we're facing ahead in our world. So thank you very much, Jim. Um, we also, this year, are partnering with Cultural Survival. And so I would love to have uh, Suzanne come up and introduce a little bit about cultural survival and what that means for this partnership between um, our, our groups and folks this year. Good morning. My name is Suzanne Benali. I'm Navajo in Santa Clara, Tewa. My maternal clan is the Kinslichini clan, and I was born for the Nashashi people of the Tewa. I welcome everyone here today on behalf of Cultural Survival and the International Indian Treaty Council. Many of you have traveled a distance to join us, and some of you have traveled from around the world to get here. We are very indebted and grateful to everyone. Cultural Survival is an international indigenous rights uh, advocacy organization whose vision is for a future that respects and honors indigenous peoples, inherent rights, and dynamic cultures, deeply and richly interwoven in lands, languages, spiritual traditions, and artistic expression rooted in self-determination and self-governance. Our work is predicated on the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and we partner with and advocate for Indigenous peoples' rights and support Indigenous communities in self-determination, 
cultures, and political resilience. We are excited to join Rising Voices along with the Indian or the International Indian Treaty Council in discussions on climate science, indigenous science, climate change, and climate justice. Cultural Survival's work spans internationally through our work in advocacy, indigenous rights radio, indigenous community media, sustainable livelihoods, and indigenous women initiatives. In all of our work, we know that at the center of indigenous people's struggles are issues of land, sacred lands, territory rights, resource rights, and environmental issues that threaten indigenous cultures and communities. That many of our communities are on the front line of climate change and the first to be severely impacted. We know that as indigenous peoples, we have understood climate change for millennia and responded to it. What is different now is the rate of change that is man-made. For these reasons, we look forward to the discussions over the next few days. We have invited our brothers and sisters from New Zealand, Honduras, Tanzania, Canada, South Africa, France, Sweden, Mexico, Belize, and Colombia to join Rising Voices in expanding the discussions beyond the U.S. borders. We seek to connect the local working communities to the international advocacy of indigenous peoples and vice versa. We will be speaking about diverse systems and constructs of knowledge, epistemologies, and worldviews. Our point is not to privilege one knowledge over another, but rather to step back, engage, and understand each other. As Jerry offered this morning and reminded us, this is heart work. Our, our work ahead is difficult and challenging, but I want to remind us that we must listen, respect, and honor each other in order to build mutually agreed upon approaches and protocols. This is about our future and the future of our children. So again, welcome. In line with the name of the event, let our voices rise. Thank you, Suzanne. And uh, now we're going to have Dan Wildcat um, welcome us for the charge for you all for the next 72 hours and beyond. Mado, uh, Sande Lee, uh, De La Sang. Uh, good morning. How are you? Are you doing well? Are you ready to work? That's what we're going to do uh, for the next two days and a half. Um, First of all, I'm, I'm very thankful that I'm surrounded by uh, young indigenous thinkers, young people in general, uh, uh, because sometimes we have, you know, language is a problem. And uh, so first thing I want to do is thank Kyle White, because he really got me straightened out this morning. Uh, because, you know, I got this email the other day, and it said, charge to rising voices. And I misinterpreted that. I thought, because we had talked about some other activities, so uh, thank goodness I was able to cancel. I had planned a whole big reception up at the Stanley Hotel, you know, up here on the Front Range, and oh, it was going to be great. Food for everyone, uh, open bar, who knows, you get, you know, you're going to have the run of the place. And I, it said, charge to rising voices, so luckily Kyle you know he said Dan that's not what that means he said Kyle said he'd take care of it so you can talk to talk to Kyle later uh, we have to laugh we have to find some way to smile we have to find some way to love because we're living in dangerous times um, those of you that are uh, familiar with uh, a lot of the work that's come out of rising voices the biggest challenge we face is is not uh, merely technological. It's not merely institutional and organizational. It's a cultural change that we're going to have to have if we're going to address the problems that face this planet and the life on this beautiful blue-green planet. 
And uh, it's the apocryphal quote that's always attributed to Einstein. Uh, you can't ever find where he actually said this, but the story goes a colleague approached him about a very difficult problem, and Einstein told him to leave it, you know, on the desk. And the next day when they went to Einstein to ask if he had, you know, any insight, he said, you know, some, you have to remember, sometimes you can't solve problems with the same kind of thinking that created them. It's time for some different thinking. And I think indigenous peoples around the planet represent a kind of thinking that is rational, that is spiritual, and most importantly is life enhancing. And so here's the charge for rising voices and, and for everyone that's here in the important work that we're going to do over the next several days. My mentor, Vine Deloria Jr., used to talk about power plus place equals personality. Tap into the power that's here in this place, in this convening. Power permeates the cosmos. Power can be used in good ways and bad ways. Every one of you possesses power. Every one of you possesses knowledge, unique knowledge. And I think as we come to this place, what we're, we've tried to do in Rising Voices is create a place, a space, where people from scientific communities, some of the best and brightest of our, of our technologically highly trained scientists can meet with some in this room whose laboratories, if you will, whose really homes were the site of the knowledge that they hold, a very deep spatial knowledge. And we're not going to get into any discussions about either or, you know, which is right, which is wrong. What we're going to do is explore where there's the complementarity, where more is better when it comes to knowledge, as Kalani always reminds us. Danielle, some minds are better than one mind. We're going to bring a lot of minds together here, and that's a lot of power. And we're going to do something very good. Here's my charge. As we, as we enter discussions over the next several days, remember, while we live in a world that everyone's fixated on resources, we're going to ask you to think about what it means to live in a world full of relatives, plant relatives, animal relatives, human relatives, relatives we don't even know yet children, our grandchildren, and those generations yet to come, that's, th those are relatives, and they're here with us, and that's power. Let's explore what it means to live among relatives and not, in a very anthropocentric way, the use of resources. And as Kalani already mentioned, and Susan knows this and in the incredible work that cultural survival, uh, survival has done really around the globe, knows this. Whenever we talk about rights, the most fundamental thing that we add to that from indigenous perspectives is those inalienable responsibilities we acknowledge that we have. You can't act, exercise rights in a good way unless you've acknowledged the responsibilities that you have. And if we can do that, if we can move from these kinds of worlds where everyone wants us to talk about how we can better use resources, to how we might better respect relatives, if we could counterbalance our notion of inalienable rights with inalienable responsibilities that we hold, I believe, no, I, I know, I don't like the distinction between believing and knowing. People always say, well, believe something that you you know, you, you kind of, maybe you don't know, but you believe. No, the most important things to me are beliefs, and I'm not going to believe something I don't know. And I know that if we, all of us in this room, can engage just one small part of that power we have, and then take that with us when we leave, that power will have a multiplying effect among many relatives. And that's our charge. That's the good work we've got to do. And that's hard work. 
It doesn't mean we're always going to agree. In fact, if we all agree, we may have some problems. We need to have some very spirited, respectful discussions. And remember, listening is one of the most important communication skills we can have. But if we do these things, I really believe that what we can do is we can leave here with some models for how we might enhance resilience, life system, life way resilience in a planet that desperately needs that right now. Because there are a lot of people that seem committed to use their rights to extract resources to make the human species the most invasive weed on the planet. And I don't want to be a weed. I want to be a flower. <laughs> That's my charge to all of you here at Rising Voices. It's not my charge. It comes from all of my relatives, people like Kalani, Jerry, Doc Tusi, Bob, everyone, and some of those that have already started their journey to the stars. Let's have a good productive couple of days, folks. So roll up your sleeves and let's get to work. Mado. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, on that note, while we queue a few things up for um, the next, let me grab this one. That's you yours. Yes. Um, for the next couple of presentations, um, I would love to invite everybody to take three minutes and just chat to those at your table and introduce yourself. Start there, and then we'll keep introducing ourselves for the next couple of days, please. <laughs>
Oh, he did? Yeah. Oh, so never mind. So it's good, yeah. yeah. I just knew that, you know, that it was seen that long ago. Well, that's why I told you. Choices, which one do you want to go with? I'm not sure Reed can tell us. Oh. Okay. <clears throat> uh oh, it's playing. Um I wasn't able to get the other guy on huh? line. Want sound. Yes. So you sound on oh, I know it was one of them. Uh yeah. It's uh on that page. We'd like to draw your attention back up here. Um, 
We are before we have before we have the next speaker come up. Um, we are we would like to share with you. We recognize um, you know many folks in this room haven't been to Rising Voices before, and a big part of Rising Voices um, is really working to incorporate youth as part of this, right? As not just youth and us, but it's it's it's, it's intersected and one in the same. And there was um, Julie and Kalani and their crew with Olohana last year um, did a beautiful couple minute film from our time together in Hawaii. And we just wanted to share that with you here because it really, um, we felt, you know, captured really, you know, the essence of, of a lot of what the discussions are about. And so to kind of get us thinking about where we're moving from here, especially for folks who, um, who haven't attended before. So we're just going to take a couple minutes to play this. <laughs> that we need in order to thrive, in order to do the adaptation that we're called to do. We need to come up with them ourselves. And there's ways of, of saying this new information that we want to, the old information we want to make new to new ears. Try to open yourself for a search, become more acquainted with it, so that you can start to understand the spiritual experience better. Be one. Be one. Be being clean. Being clean. That's one piece as one machine there you go so what is it like when you're doing your work in the world and you're trying to get that message across to someone and they're quite not hearing you it might just take one syllable change whole soul there is no one mountain or sea They're the official sponsor, right? Yeah. Um, all right, we are going to have Shannon McNeely yeah. yes. come up uh, for us uh, now. Shannon is with the North Central Climate Science Center just up the road in Fort Collins. And she's going to provide a couple updates for us, one on the fourth US National Climate Assessment and also on um, some of the tribal liaisons that have been coming on board with the climate science centers. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Colorado. It's nice to see a lot of familiar faces again, and welcome to the newbies in the room. So I was asked to talk about the uh, Fourth National Climate Assessment. As Julie said, I am one of the authors on what is now being called the Tribal and Indigenous Communities Chapter. Um, and we probably have several. How many people are authors for the Fourth National Climate Assessment in the room? So there's a few around. Kyle, raise your hand. Um, and Beth Marino um, isn't feeling well at the moment, but she's supposed to be here. She's also an author on this chapter. And I uh, borrowed this presentation from our lead authors, which you can see down there at the bottom, Rachel Novak from BIA and uh, Leslie Juntarasamy from EPA. Um, and how many people were uh, authors on the last National Climate Assessment? So there's quite a few who are on that one as well. So I know a lot of people are familiar with the National Climate Assessment, but for the people who are not, I'm going to just give a little bit of a um, quick background. 
So uh, the National Climate Assessment was established with the Global Change Research Act in 1990, which also established the U.S. Global Change Research Program, which coordinates, it's an interagency um, coordination. Uh, and so this is now the fourth National Climate Assessment. The first National Climate Assessment, I believe, was in 2001 or so. Um, and then the third one, the last one, was in um, 2014. Is that when they released that one? So indigenous peoples have been involved in the National Climate Assessment since the beginning. Um, the first report that came out is on the left, the um, Native Peoples, Native Homelands. Uh, this was based on a workshop for, uh, for input uh, that happened in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Then we had another Native Peoples, Native Homelands workshop in Minnesota. Um, in 2010, I believe it was. But then with the third National Climate Assessment, this was the first time there was actually a chapter dedicated to indigenous peoples. And Julie and Bob and Bull and some other folks were um, part of leading that charge. And then recently, there was also a human health report that came out that has a focus on uh, indigenous peoples as well. So for this fourth National Climate Assessment, there's been a variety of um, tribal engagement and indigenous peoples engagement. I won't read through the list. You can read it yourself there. But um, there's been multiple ways of trying to get input from indigenous peoples for the fourth National Climate Assessment, um, including uh, talking about it last year at Rising Voices. And we hope to maybe get some more input at this Rising Voices. So this just gives an outline of uh, the current uh, National Climate Assessment, NCA4, with some new chapters that are coming on board that weren't in the last one. Um, importantly, there are some expanded regional chapters, like the Great Plains was all one region in the last National Climate Assessment. Now it's broken down into two. And this is important because this is one of the ways that indigenous peoples can engage with the National Climate Assessment because uh, something that's new in NCA4 is that we tried to make sure that there was at least one person in each regional chapter who could um, write up the indigenous peoples section. So instead of just having it all funneled into one chapter, we're now having it more dispersed throughout the National Climate Assessment, which is a good thing. And then there's several response chapters as well on adaptation and mitigation and so on. So. Uh, for the draft outline for the Indigenous Peoples chapter, we're, we're of course limited to six pages, so it's really a high-level summary, and we're hoping by integrating it more into the regional chapters and some of the other sector chapters that we can get more of the, of the wealth of knowledge and literature on Indigenous Peoples and climate change throughout the whole National Climate Assessment. Um, so the state of the sector is an important piece of the chapter, um, and this is building upon all the great work that was done in NCA3 and the climate change, the climate science special report, um, looking at stressors and trends, and then what we're really supposed to be doing for this national climate assessment is talking about what's new since NCA3 and that climate and health assessment that I showed you. And so another important part of this is, again, coordinating with the regional chapter t um, teams, and particularly those people writing the indigenous people section. So Julie and I are actually helping to coordinate those folks to try and get everyone together so that we can be um, collaborating on how we're using terminology and the types of issues that are going into those chapters. And so the idea is that, the, that each of those regional chapters will roll up. They're calling it the roll up. Um, on these different topics. So climate, culture, and health, water resources, economy and livelihoods, built environment, disaster management, and relocation. Or I put expand in there for Beth. She's not here, but apparently at Shishmaraf, that's now how they're talking about relocation is expansion. So some of the draft key messages that are coming out of the chapter, um, this is the hardest part of the National Climate Assessment, is that we have to come up with these key messages to sort of summarize everything. And it's nearly impossible, especially when you're talking about indigenous peoples and all the you know 567 sovereign nations and so on and so forth. So it's very challenging. But right now, um, key message number one is focusing on tribal livelihoods and economies that are at risk. For example, subsistence, commercial, and health, household economies that are affected, and also um, infrastructure vulnerability. Key message number two, um, draft key message number two, I should say, is focusing on tribal culture, health, and well-being that are at risk. For example, contamination, uh, such as infectious diseases, nutrition, access tradi to traditional foods and medicine, mental health, um, and relocation impacts on cultural and health. 
And then the last draft key message are about um, challenges and opportunities along the path to sustainable, culturally appropriate tribal adaptation, such as, for example, um, how, how some tribes and indigenous communities have low adaptive capacity, um, but also, for example, they, are, they provide a long history as observers and monitors of the land and weather that can inform adaptation strategies and social cohesion and so on. So some of the take home messages um, from the lead authors are that, as I mentioned, tribal, tribal and indigenous issues will now be integrated more so throughout the whole national climate assessment. Um, like the last national climate assessment, it will focus on observations, pro projections, and impacts, but adaptations and, and actual adaptation strategies will be much more highlighted in this one because so much has happened since the last national climate assessment um, through a lot of the BIA funding and other funding that's been available that so many tribes are out there working on adaptation projects right now, so there's going to be a lot more of that in this national climate assessment. And so lastly, um, ways to engage with the sustained national climate assessment include, um, there's gonna be a session at the National Adaptation uh, Forum in St. Paul, Minnesota in May. How many people are going to the National Adaptation Forum? Great, so there's gonna be a great turnout. Um, so we actually, there's a bunch of tribal sessions um, and indigenous sessions, and that information is already starting to circulate. But specific to the National Climate Assessment, um, on the last day of, of NAF, there's a working group session in the afternoon that's going to be looking at the National Climate Assessment uh, and combined with uh, looking at traditional ecological knowledge and climate change. And then there's one other topic that I'm forgetting. They, we got combined like three different working groups. So we're all going to be one big happy family. So everybody, come on down. Um, and then there's going to be, um, right now it's planned for the fall of 2017, the public review and comment period, so the notices will go out. You can see the URL right there, globalchange.gov backslash notices, that you can actually read the components of the National Climate Assessment and give your feedback, and the authors have to address all the feedback that we're given. Um, and then what else? Call for public input and in future projects, processes. Um, oh, and you can sign up for the NCA emails if you're not already on it at globalchange.gov backslash newsletter dash sign up. Um, and so these are some of the ways. And if you have other questions or comments, please see me or any of the other authors um, throughout the week. So switching gears here a little bit, I was also asked to give an update on the Climate Science Center uh, tribal liaisons. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the Climate Science Centers, there, there are eight regional climate science centers throughout the country, including uh, the Pacific Islands and Alaska. I'm based at the North Central Climate Science Center in Fort Collins. They're all based at universities. It's a USGS uh, university partnership funded by the Department of Interior. So what's happening now is the BIA has provided funding for each of the climate science centers to have a tribal liaison. So it's funded by the BIA, but they are the, the funding goes to a tribal organization in that region. That tribal organization actually hires the liaison, and then the, the liaison will sit at the, the respective climate science centers. So the, the status on that right now is there have been um, two liaisons hired so far, one in the Southwest Climate Science Center region through AHEC. So they're sitting at, um, in Tucson at the University of Arizona. The Alaska liaison was hired uh, by the Aleutian Pribilof Islands Association. They will sit at the University of Alaska Anchorage. Um, the Northwest Climate Science Center uh, is in the process of getting their liaison. That person is supposed to start in June, um, it's uncertain where that person is going to sit. They might be in Corvallis at Oregon State, but um, there's some uncertainty around that. The uh, South Central, of course, has had one for a while. April Taylor at um, University of Oklahoma. She was hired by Chickasaw Nation. The Northeast Southeast is combined for some reason. That's a huge. <laughs> huge region. Um, that poor person is going to have a lot of traveling to do. Um, there's actually a solicitation out right now for that job. So if anyone is job hunting, let's see Erin Sasu over there. Uh, she's with the, the Southeast Climate Science Center. She has information about that hire. So I encourage you to talk to her, talk to me if, if anyone's interested in uh, applying for that job. 
Um, what's the deadline for that? Open until filled. There you go. So somebody go, fill it. Um, and lastly, uh, there isn't a Midwest Climate Science Center. There was going to be, but it didn't happen. But in spite of that, there's going to be a Midwest um, liaison who is going to be hired through the College of Menominee Nation. And um, I, I assume they're going to sit at College of Menominee. Is, anyone, is Chris here? Are they going to sit there? University of Minnesota. OK. Are you involved in that hire at all? So see Chris Caldwell right there if, if anyone's interested in that one. And then last but not least, sadly, at the North Central Climate Science Center, we're going to be the last ones to get our liaison. Um, the uh, org tribal organization has been selected, but there's some issues going on. It's a new organization. They don't quite have their um, their incorporation set up yet, their, their uh, proper paperwork set up yet for the funding. So they're in the process of doing that now. So stay tuned for that. That's going to be a while. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't think they're getting one, unfortunately. I, I don't know why. <laughs> Everybody talk to Kalani. If, if anybody has questions about the Pacific Islands CSC, um, we'll leave it at that. And that's it. So thank you. And if anybody has any questions about anything, either the National Climate Assessment or the CSC liaisons, I'll be here today and tomorrow. Please come talk to me. Thank you. Thanks, Shannon. And, you know, in the spirit of all of this, you know, national collaborative work, um, none of this happens without these robust, uh, deep, and broad networks of people working together. And part of that um, feeds into some work that Carla Dillon is doing to look into this kind of network, social networks, among uh, folks who are doing this kind of work. She did some um, surveys about social network analysis at Rising Voices 4. So shifting us back again to Hawaii, Carla's going to talk a little bit about her results from that. Let me cue that up. Beautiful pictures, good memories. Hi, I'm Carla Dillon. Um, I am a multi-heritage person with very wide roots, uh, born and raised in California. And I currently reside in Michigan amongst Anishinaabe friends in Anishinaabe lands. And I'm having a great time there, although it's very cold. Um, and I've uh, been part of Rising Voices for a few years. And as Heather said, I've been working on some social network analysis with our group. Some of you who were there last year took a survey. And so I just want to give you just a couple snapshots of what we found in doing this uh, analysis. But first, what is social network analysis? The way we're using it here is a way to get a little bit better picture of us as a whole group. Can you hear me? Closer. Can you hear me? <laughs> OK. The way we're using it is to get a better picture of us as a whole group. And um, what it does is. Uh, help Rising Voices think about building collaborations, how to foster some long-term relationships and long-term trust and what's going on amongst us, to think about respectful knowledge sharing, to ask a little bit about that and work on that, to think about how we're building climate adaptation capacity in our communities, and then how are we networking to support that work. And then moving from science to action, the thing we did at Rising Voices 4 just gives a little snapshot of some of the action already taking place. And we're going to do this again this year. So um, in a minute, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But first, a little bit on what we, we found last year. So this isn't a social network graph, um, but it is something we asked about last year, which is how long have people in this group known each other? The group was much smaller last year. Um, but what this tells you um, on the bottom, on the x-axis, is how long people have known each other. Every two people reported on how long you've known each other. On the y-axis going up is how many different pairs said, hey, I've known this, uh, this person this long. So what this is showing us, the, the green graph, is how many people, for example, the 176 is 176 different pairs of people have known each other between one and three years. So what this tells us is that 35% um, of all possible connections who were at RV last year knew each other. 35% of every single two people who could know each other um, reported knowing each other. 
And you can see a lot of relational growth in the last five years, which is not surprising. We're in RV5, right? But also interesting, 4% um, of all connections have known each other longer than five years. So those are long-term relationships that RV can continue to build on. We're not going to ask you this again this year because it took a long time to fill this out. Um, so this is what a social network graph looks like. And I know it looks like a hairball at first. So I'm going to tell you what it is. Each uh, circle or square is a person. We take your name completely out of it, so unfortunately you become a number. So everyone is a number. And so each um, square or circle is a person who was there last year. All the lines are the connections that you've reported between each other. And what this graph is reporting, we asked about sharing of knowledge, climate change knowledge. Have you shared, have you received climate change knowledge from every other person in the group? So this reports all the different lines, all the different connections around knowledge sharing in the whole group. Here, 21% of all possible connections were reported. So that's a lot of, a lot of knowledge moving around. On average, every person was sharing knowledge with 11 other people. So, um, and I'll come back to some of this in a minute. Um, but some of why we're doing this, not only because it's part of my dissertation, so thank you <laughs> for that, um, but <laughs> appreciate that part of it. <laughs> uh, no, but it shows not just connections, but some of how these collaborations are taking place. For example, this graph could tell us things about um, how centralized a network is. I mean, what if all the knowledge was going through one person, for example? And you can see in this case that that's not what's happening. It's pretty well spread out. So those are some of the things that we can learn by doing this. One other thing we asked about is um, who's working on climate change decision making or climate change policy with everyone else? So you reported every possible person that you were doing that with. Um, the two graphs were about the same, so I've combined them. And you can see here it's a lot, it is a lot less dense. Um, those are things that you know, rising voices could think about. You know, this isn't as much as the knowledge sharing. What are we about as a group? Um, it's very descriptive. It's not saying here's what should be there. That's not what I'm doing, but it's to know about who we are, right? So in this case, um, only 8% of all possible connections are shown, and on average, everyone is working with four other people. The people shown off to the left are ones who didn't have any connections. So on the previous graph, everyone is connected. And this one, there are some people who are not connected. Again, that's not um, a judgment of the group. It's just something good to know about ourselves in terms of some of the work we're doing. The other interesting thing about this graph is it is a little bit more centralized than the others. And I've turned on. Um, you're able to look at the information in a lot of different ways. And I turned on both age and gender for each of the little dots, because it turned out to be kind of interesting to see, to compare the two graphs. So in this one, it's mainly, um, the central roles are being played mainly by indigenous men, 51 through 70. You can see there in the middle, and it is more centralized, whereas this graph, the squares are women. So there's kind of more women at the center of this one. So again, just it's descriptive, but uh, something to know about ourselves. And um, to think about fostering collaborative work. Um, not a whole lot of young people on here, but I'm actually not able to survey people under 17, so that's unfortunate. It's not that we don't want to know um, what's happening with people under 17, but it's just a little more complicated to include. So. So we're going to do this again this year. It's a much bigger group. Um, we're not going to fill the survey out right now. We did do that last year. We're not going to do that to you. <laughs> um, so a couple people are going to start handing out the surveys, Chad and Melinda. Thank you. Um, we do it by paper because it's just a little easier to, um, well, anyway, you don't, it's a little easier to get the, the data that way. So um, this year, the survey is going to ask similar questions about climate change and collaborations with everyone else who's here. So your names are on this. Again, I won't include your name in anything. You unfortunately become a number, um, but your name won't be listed. There's a few people who registered after Monday, and you're not on the list, but please go ahead and take the survey anyway. Um, 
Let's see. So the last page is something a little different, and this is an event evaluation page. This is where you have a full page, um, maybe on Friday, Friday evening, to sit down and reflect a little bit on this gathering as we get toward the end of it. What things you liked, what things you might suggest for another time. So that final page is your evaluation. And once I get these back from you, I'll disconnect that last page so your name won't be on that. So feel free to just report anything on the final page that you'd like. So how I'd like to get these back from you guys is either Friday evening or Saturday morning. I'll probably stand like over there and maybe jump up and down a little bit and be like, I'm the one. <laughs> or some people know me. I know quite a few people, so you can ask around. But I'll just stand over there toward the end of the event. Yeah, or ask Julie or Heather. Um, yeah. No, lo siento. Um, pero we, we, we might be able to uh, translate through it. I only found out a couple days ago that there were people who didn't. So, um, we'll talk about that. Yeah. Um, so just thank you. Um, don't worry if you don't know very many people. Building collaborations and trust just takes a lot of time. So it's, it's not that. And uh, your participation really helps Rising Voices better understand and foster respectful relationships, effective collaborations, working together. So any other questions right now? Okay. Thanks. Did anyone not get a survey? OK. Question? Oh, you. I'll get you back. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank you very much, Carla. And I think, you know, one of the things we try to keep in mind with Rising Voices is that this is not your average climate or weather research workshop, right? And so one of the challenges is to try to sort of um, illustrate how successful it is. And in conversations with Kyle White and Carla and others, one of our metrics of, of success is building these relationships, right? There's a qualitative sense to this as well as quantitative. And so that is one of the ways in which um, we too are benefiting actually from Carla's research for her dissertation. And so that's a wonderful opportunity. That last page that she mentioned, um, just a plea to you to please, you know, reflect on your experience here when you hand that in to us. It helps us know, you know, how to calibrate the meetings um, differently, what worked for you, you know, what, what we should keep in mind going forward. It's invaluable information for us and for NCAR and for our funders to, to know and have that feedback from you. So please do. Um, send that along to us. You can also, you know, our, Julie and my email addresses are all over the place. Feel free to send us emails on your reflections as well if that is an easier way for you to go about doing that. Um, we are eating into our break here, so we want to let you guys have a break, but just a couple quick announcements. Um, we are going to have pizza this evening before heading off to um, a public event. So if I can just get a, a show of hands of the number of folks who would like to join us for a pizza party that will probably either be in here if the weather um, is not great or hopefully outside if the weather is great. So just a quick show of hands and someone to help me count them. OK, awesome. Thank you. And we'll just have a selection of different types of pizza. Um, if you, we will do vegetarian and meat. If you need something that's either gluten-free or dairy-free, please um, let us know. Which one? Gluten-free? OK. Gluten-free? OK, cool. So we'll make sure we have some of those options as well. We'll also have salads, <coughs> excuse me, and drinks. Um, Reminder to please look at the posters and um, during the break, come back at 10.30 and? Um, <laughs> anyone who was asked to facilitate um, or note take during a breakout group session, sorry, please stay um, before you leave for your break. So just come up here real quick. Thank you. Otherwise, feel free to take a break and we'll see you at 10.30. Thanks.